was the second century, uh, barely three generations following the, the life and the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And during that period of time, second, uh, early third century, Christianity was literally exploding across the Roman Empire. And as you can imagine, those people who had not professed a relationship with Jesus Christ were, uh, were uh, highly suspicious of those who did profess a relationship with, Christ, with, with Jesus Christ. There was quite a bit of conflict between the two, in fact. Um, and, and, and that conflict really kind of was grounded in the fact that those people who didn't follow Jesus saw something in those who did follow Jesus that was fundamentally different from what they were experiencing in their lives. And there was jealousy that kind of that arose out of that. There was a, there was a fear um, that arose out of that, um, out of the, the pagan culture as they looked at, at what was going on within these Christians. In fact, um, kind of as a response to, to the, the, the powerful Christian movement that was, that was emerging, there was some fake news that emerged. It didn't just happen in 2017. I mean, it, 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 it happened even then. And, and there, I mean, there, there were stories that would be generated about what Christians said and did in their meetings together. And you can imagine what people would say about these Christians. And it was, it was completely um, groundless, but they said it as a way to keep people from being willing to profess their faith in Jesus. And so, so into this arena emerged a group of Christian leaders that were called apologists. One of those apologists was Justin Martyr. And Justin Martyr and Clement of Alexandria and Tertullian were three of the, of the big apologists of that era. And they would write treatises to, to try to help people understand truly what Christianity was all about. Justin Martyr said this about Christians during that time period. He said, we who used to value the acquisition of wealth and possessions more than anything else, we now bring what we have into a common fund and we share it with anyone who needs it. We used to hate and destroy one another and we refused to associate with people of another race or country. But now, because of Christ, we live together with such people and we pray for our enemies. Clement of Alexandria said this uh, at, in that same period about people who, who professed faith in Jesus Christ. He said, he impoverishes himself out of love so that he is certain he may never overlook a brother in need, especially, especially if he knows that he can bear poverty better than his brother. He likewise considers the pain of another as his own pain. And if he suffers any hardship because of having given out of his own poverty... He doesn't complain. In the third century, um, a, a plague swept across the entire ancient world, and, and it was devastating. But as that plague moved across the, the landscape of, of that of, of that of that that people, um, the Christians the Christians were the only ones who cared for the sick, and they did so at the risk of themselves contracting the plague. While at the same time, the, the, the pagans were throwing infected members of their own families out into the streets, even before they died, just to protect themselves from contracting the plague. I mean, that's just an example, a small example of, of the, the, the different ways Christians and pagans acted and lived during that period of time. Tertullian wrote this in 197 AD. He said, it is mainly the deeds of a love so noble that lead many to put a brand on us. See how they love one another, they say, for they themselves are animated by mutual hatred. How they are ready to die for one another, they say, for they themselves will sooner be put to death. Those words that Tertullian wrote have, have just continued to speak to me. See how they love one another. That's what they said about Christians in the second and third century. See how they love one another. Let me ask you this question. Is that what people think when they see you and me? When they see us in the grocery store? When they see us driving on a traffic-infested street? When they see us at a football game? Is that what they say about us? See how they love one another? When they see you in your neighborhood, 
when they see you with your family, when they see you with your friends? Is that what they see how they love one another? I'm going to tell you, this is serious stuff that we're talking about today. Because there are a lot of people who watch us, us being Christians. I mean, we live in a watching world today. The culture outside these walls is a culture that is just waiting to see Christians mess up. It's a world that's waiting just to see if, if, if what we profess on Sundays will be lived out Monday through Saturday. There are people who are watching to see how you treat other people. They're listening for the things that you say to other people. I dare say, if, if you've got a, a non-Christian friend who hurts you or offends you, don't think for one second that they aren't waiting to see how you're going to respond to them. If you choose not to forgive them, if you choose to snub them, it's just your, your actions toward them are just going to play right into the narrative that so many people outside the Christian faith um, think about Christianity, that it's just all talk and no substance. We live in a watching world. And the fact of the matter is, as Christians, and this is no different today than it was 2,000 two, 2, years ago, as Christians, we are supposed to be different. Different. This was even the case in the Old Testament. I mean, you look at the story of the people of the Old Testament, and, and God continually got mad at Israel because it seemed like every place they would settle, wherever it was, despite all the warnings that God gave to the people of Israel to say, remember my laws, keep my laws, live this way, live this way, no matter how many times God would say it to them, they'd move into a new culture, and they would just assimilate themselves into the culture surrounding them. And it infuriated God. And then Jesus comes along and, and in his Sermon on the Mount, he says, you, you being you who are follow my followers, you are salt. You are light, he said. In other words, you're different from the rest of the world. And as salt and light, you as my followers are to have an impact on the world. You're not to be like everybody else. You're to have an impact through the way you speak and the way you act and the way you behave. And all that you do, you are to be different, he said. In fact, James put it this way in James 1, 27. He said, pure and genuine religion in the sight of God the Father means caring for orphans and widows in their distress, and then don't miss this, and refusing to let the world corrupt you. Another translation of that same verse puts the end of that verse this way. We are to keep ourselves unstained from the world. I don't know that it could be put more succinctly than that. We are to live our lives in such a way that we are not corrupted by the world. And we are to live our lives in such a way that we are to remain unstained by the world. We are to be different. And what I'm talking about this morning, this is why this is so important. What I'm talking about this morning is the part of our lives that is the most visible part of our lives to other people. And that is our relationships with others. And I, I tell you, there's, I don't think there's been a more important time in history for us as followers of Jesus Christ than now to stand strong in our relationships. When I talk about relationships... I'm talking about all the relationships in our lives. I'm talking about your friends. I'm talking about the relationships you have, even with casual relationships with acquaintances. I'm talking about the relationship you have with your children. I'm talking about the relationship you have with your spouse, with your parents, with your coworkers, with your neighbors. All of the relationships that, 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 that compose the landscape of your relational life, that's what I'm talking about today. And as I've thought about that, I've thought about all the, the different kinds of relationships that we have, I was struck by the notion that for too many of us, for too many of us, our friendships oftentimes influence our behaviors more than our faith influences our behaviors. Think about that for a second. For too many of us, our friendships influence our behaviors more than our faith influences our behaviors. This is something the scripture proves true. In Proverbs 13, 20, it says this, walk with the wise and become wise. Associate with fools and get in trouble. How true is that? 
I can't tell you how many times my grandmother would say, son, you better watch who you hang out with. Well, she didn't use the word hang out with. I mean, that's, that wasn't around then. She, watch who you spend your time with, she said. And, and then and she'd say, you know, birds of a feather, what? So you've heard that too. So I'm not telling you something you don't know. And, and that's, so, that's so true. Our, our, our friendship circles, our relational circles are vitally important to us. They, they, they shape us. In fact, um, uh, this it has not anything to do with friends, but, but I was, uh, Joe Carroll Red was at the 8 o'clock service this morning, and she was a substitute teacher for my kids um, on numerous occasions when they were um, at Pebble Creek Elementary School. And, and my kids tell me this, Joe Carroll never did, but my kids tell me that one of her um, favorite things to say, she'd see a kid with a baseball hat on backwards, and she'd tell that kid to turn that hat around. She would tell them, the direction that the bill of your hat is facing is the direction your life is headed. <laughs> and I thought, wow. So I don't ever wear a, a baseball hat turned around backwards because of that. But, but that's, that's, that talks about our clothing. And our clothing does speak sometimes, a lot about us at times. But, but more significantly is what our friendships say about us. I came across this statement as I was preparing for this message. And it's a, it's a, it's a pretty good one. Show me your friends and I'll show you who you are. It's pretty true, isn't it? Show me your friends and I'll show you who you are. One that, 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 that probes a little bit deeper and says it a little bit more clearly, at least as far as I'm concerned, is this. You are the average of the five people you spend the most time with. Now think about that for a second. You are the average of the five people you spend the most time with. And, and I know that that's been the case with me. If, if, if ever I uh, spend a week with my family of origin, my family will tell you, I come back and... I, I'm talking like I talked when I was growing up, or I talk like my family. Um, or uh, if I'm around certain friends for a long enough period of time, I'll start talking like, the, am I the only one that has this happen? I don't think I am. I mean, so, so you think about this. You are the average of the five people you spend the most time with. Who are those people for you? And how are they impacting your life? I mean, the relationships that we establish, the relationships that we keep are vitally important to us and, and they're shaping in our lives. And it's because of that truth, I think we need to spend time talking about how important it is for us to stand strong in our relationships so that our friendships don't define who we are, but the conviction of our hearts define who we are. I mean, it's so important that who we are is defined by the, by the conviction of our hearts rather than by the connection of our friends. Or to put it another way, the thesis of this sermon today is this. As a Christian, your faith and not your friendships determine your identity. As a Christian, your faith and not your friendships determine your identity. Therefore, many of us today need to rise up in our faith so that we can stand strong as followers of Jesus in all of the relationships that we're engaged in. So how do we do that? Well, there's several things I think we need to, we need to do um, uh, or, or realize as we, uh, as we um, consider how it is that we might stand strong in our relationships. The first is this. We need to recognize our responsibility for one another. We need to recognize our responsibility for one another. I have a responsibility to you, and you have a responsibility to me. And, that's a, and I'm speaking at one level of a corporate responsibility. As, as your pastor, I have a responsibility for you, and, and, and you collectively have a responsibility for me. But individually, the same rule applies. I have a responsibility um, to you, Bob, and you have a responsibility to me as, as friends that we are. Hebrews 10, 24 and 25 puts it like this. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, 
but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. I, I love that, that, those two verses. That, that it talks about how important it is for us to encourage one another. We all need encouragement daily. I, a few weeks ago, um, Kyle preached a sermon on Barnabas where he talked about the importance of, of, of encouraging one another. We've got to be a people who encourage each other, not, not tear each other down. But the most important word in this, these two verses is the first verse. Let us consider how to stir up one another to love and to good works. I need that in my life. I need someone to come up alongside me and stir me up to love and to good works. And it's one of my, my foundational responsibilities as the pastor of this church. One of my primary responsibilities as your pastor is to do everything that I can to stir you up to love and good works. To do that through the preaching. To do that through the leadership I demonstrate over the programs and ministries that happen through this church. My, one of my primary responsibilities is to do everything I can to help you as members of Christ United Methodist Church to be stirred up to love and to good works. To love one another. Of course, to love Jesus first. But to let that love pour out into your lives as you love one another. But not just those within this group. But to love those outside these walls. And that's where we're stirred up to good works, to take the gospel outside of these walls and take it to the uttermost parts of the world. Now, there's a byproduct of this. The byproduct of good works is deepened relationships. I can't tell you how um, the relationships that I have with those um, that I participated in a mission trip, um, th those relationships grow more deeply than they do outside of that mission trip. Every time I've, like a few years ago, or several years ago, I went with Tim Ackerman to Nepal. We spent two weeks there, and our relationship with each other grew in ways that it could never have grown had we just been stateside. This summer, I went to Costa Rica with, with a, a group of juniors and seniors in high school and, 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 and some adults that, that accompanied us, and I watched those youth come together in ways that, that they had not come together in all the years that they had spent together in, youth, in our youth group. It happened while they were serving alongside each other on the mission field. When you're engaging in good works with others, your relationships deepen. So that's one of the reasons why we're called to, to, uh, to, to stir one another up, to love and to good works. So we've got to recognize those responsibilities that we have toward one another. Secondly, We've got to reflect our relationship with Jesus in all of our relationships. We've got to reflect our relationship with Jesus in all of our relationships. Colossians 3, verses 12 through 14, puts it like this. Since God chose you to be the holy people he loves, that's how it starts. It starts by saying you are a chosen person of God. And because you are a chosen of God, you are dearly loved by him. And because of that, this is what you must do. You must clothe yourselves with tenderhearted mercy, with kindness, with humility, with gentleness and patience. Make allowance for each other's faults and forgive anyone who offends you. Remember the Lord forgave you, so you must also forgive others. Above all, he says, clothe yourselves with love, which binds all together in perfect harmony. So he starts off by pointing out who we are. We are followers of Jesus. And as followers of Jesus, we are chosen by God and dearly loved by him. And because of that, this is, this is, this is how we reflect our relationship with Jesus into our other relationships. We clothe ourselves in certain ways. He says, this is what you put on. This is what other people are going to see. You clothe yourselves with compassion, with kindness, with humility, with meekness, with patience. You, you, you put up with each other. And if somebody offends you, you forgive them. Just as Christ has forgiven you, so you must also forgive. Don't think for one second. If an, if an unbelieving friend of yours offends you and you choose not to forgive that person, don't think for a second that they're not going to notice. As followers of Jesus, we're to clothe ourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. We're to forgive as Jesus has forgiven us. And then we wrap it all up. The, if you're, I'm not going to say that. I was going to say the bow on our hair. That doesn't work right. Um, but but the, the, the final part of our clothing that just covers it all is love. Because it binds everything together in perfect harmony. 
Which leads to one, another passage of scripture that, that, uh, that I've been thinking about and, and, and praying through as I've been preparing for this message. It comes from 1 Peter 4, verses 7 and 11. And it says this, the end of the world is coming soon. That's how it starts. In other words, there's an urgency here. Time is running short. The end of the world is coming soon. Therefore, be earnest and disciplined in your prayers. But most important of all, continue to show deep love for each other. Why? For love covers a multitude of sins. You're going to mess up. You're going to say something. Somebody's going to say something to you. Somebody's going to hurt you. You're going to hurt somebody else. And so we gotta, we've got we've to make it a point to show deep love for each other. For that deep love covers a multitude of sins. Cheerfully share your home with those who need a meal or a place to stay. God has given each of you a gift from his great variety of spiritual gifts, it says. Use them well to serve one another. Do you have the gift of speaking? Then speak as though God himself were speaking through you. Do you have the gift of helping others? Then do it with all the strength and energy that God supplies. Then everything you do will bring glory to God through Jesus Christ. <laughs> you listen to that text and there's that word love again. Continue to show deep love for each other. Not superficial love, not, not just a casual kind of warm fuzzy love, but continue to show deep, sacrificial, self-giving love for one another. And then cheerfully share your home with those who need a meal or a place to stay. In other words, don't be shut off from other people. Show hospitality. Be open to others. Welcome them in. And then finally, he says in this text, recognize the gift that God has given you and use it for his glory. If you have the gift of speaking, then speak as though God were speaking through you. If you have the gift of music, then sing as though God were singing through you. If you have the gift of counseling, then counsel another person as though Jesus were sitting in the chair that you're sitting in. If you have the gift of, of healing, then heal as though the hand of Jesus were working through your hand as you heal. If you have the gift of serving then, and, and helping others, then do it with all the strength and all the energy that God supplies so that everything you do, whether it be through what you say or what you sing or what you do, or how you talk, everything you do will bring glory to God through Jesus Christ. So we've got to reflect our relationship with Jesus into all of our relationships. And then third, we've got to recognize the handiwork of God in our relationships. We've got to recognize what God is up to in our relationships. As I was working on this sermon, I, uh, I, I was really drawn to the Old Testament story of one of the great friendships in the Bible, uh, the, the friendship between David and Jonathan. And, and, and you can read about that friendship starting in 1 Samuel chapter 18, and, and it goes on through, um, through quite a bit of 1 Samuel. Uh, off and on, you hear about Jonathan and David. But it starts off in 1 Samuel 18, verse 1, with these words. As soon as David had finished speaking to Saul, Saul was king, Saul was Jonathan's father. As soon as David had finished speaking to Saul, the soul of Jonathan was knit to the soul of David. And Jonathan loved him as his own soul. Isn't that a beautiful description? The soul of Jonathan was knit to the soul of David. Is there somebody in your life that that could be said of in relation to you? That your soul is knit to that other person? It's a beautiful thing when that happens. What that tells me, though, as I read this, is that, that, that David and Jonathan didn't make that happen. That was something that God did in the moment. God knit their souls together, which tells me that God is always at work in our relationships. He is always at work at one level in our relationships. And in fact, he's often at work at many levels, but, but he's always at work in our relationships. Well, what we have to do, if we're going to be a people who stand strong in our relationships we got to look for where God is moving in our relationships and then go there. we got to look for where God is moving in our relationships and then we got to go there. I'll tell you, we, we, I think we shut down more opportunities for growth in our relationships simply because we don't feel like pursuing those Holy Spirit promptings. A friend of yours invites you to, to be a part of their small group. 
but you don't go because you don't feel like it. Or your spouse in, invites you to spend some time doing a devotional with her, but you put her off. Or your kids come to you, and I'm, I'm, I'm preaching to the, to the proverbial choir here, I'm not talking to you, but, but your kids come and say, Mom and Dad, when are we going to go to church? But you don't answer the question because you really don't have time. And yet through all of those means, God is, is through the Holy Spirit prompting you into something deeper, something more, something richer. And how many times in the relationships in our lives do we miss opportunities to go deeper just because we don't feel like engaging or we ignore those promptings of the Holy Spirit? We've got to look for where it is that God is moving in our relationships and then go there. And then fourth, we've got to be real with each other. We've got to be real with each other. In 1 Samuel 18, 3, um, we read this, Jonathan made a covenant with David because he loved him as his own soul. And then Jonathan did something as a, to, to demonstrate his sincerity in establishing this covenant with David. And, and when I first read this, it didn't really speak to me, but the more I looked at it, the more, more deeply it, it hit me. This is what happens, 1 Samuel 18, 4. Jonathan stripped himself of the robe that was on him and he gave it to David and his armor and even his sword and his bow and his belt. And I read that and I thought, what's up with that? I mean, what's really going on there? And then, and then it occurred to me, you, you, you don't just drift into deep friendships. Deep friendships don't just happen. It takes intentional pursuit it takes intentional commitment. Jonathan is pursuing David. He sees something in David's heart. He sees something in David that says, you know, I want to get to know him better. I want to be a brother with him. But he knew that their relationship would never deepen as long as Jonathan was a prince and David was beneath him. So what did he do? He did what Chris was talking about in the children's sermon this morning. He opened up. He opened up. He took off his robe. He took off his armor. He took off his sword and his bow and his belt. Those things that protected him, those things that were symbol of, symbols of his power and his authority, and he handed them to David. In other words, he put himself at David's level. And friends, let me just tell you this. We will never, ever grow deeper in our relationships with other people unless we put ourselves on their level and walk in their shoes. Amen. Jonathan knew that he had to do that with David. And he did. And likewise, you don't just join a group or you don't just spend time with somebody and expect that a deep relationship is just going to emerge. It takes a personal investment. You've got to be intentional. Otherwise, that relationship will remain shallow and superficial. Proverbs 18, 24 says this. Some people, some friends play at friendship, but a true friend sticks closer than one's nearest kin. May it not be said of us that we are people who simply play at friendship. But may it be said of us that we care deeply about our relationships so much so that we stick close together as if we were with each other's kin. Let's not play at friendships. Let's be real with each other. And then finally, if we're going to stand strong in our relationships, we've got to build each other up. We've got to build each other up. I can't tell you how important this is. There have been so many times in my life when, when I've just, I've, I've needed that. I've needed somebody to do that for me. And I suspect that the same is true for you. It's the way it was for David. You kind of fast forward in the story of David and, and, and Jonathan. And, and, uh, and you have to understand Saul, King Saul, hated David. He burned with jealousy uh, for David because 
well, David continued to be victorious in battle. And people would say things like, Saul killed a thousand, but David killed ten thousands. And Saul wanted him dead. In fact, in 1 Samuel 23, verse 14, it says this, Saul hunted David day after day. Do you ever feel like that? Do you ever feel like you're being hunted day after day? The day after day, it just feels like one thing after another gets put on your shoulders and the weight gets heavier and heavier and heavier and you wonder how you're going to take another step. 1 Peter 5.8 says that, that our enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking for someone to destroy. I don't know if you felt this, but I felt that lion's breath on the back of my neck before. And what's amazing about the way God works is that that inevitably there will be an email I get from somebody. They'll say, I just want to tell you how much I appreciate what you do. Or I'll get a phone call. Or somebody will stop by my office. And they'll give me a word of encouragement. To build me up. That's what friends do. That's what people who stand strong in their relationships do. We build each other up. And that's what Jonathan did with David. Look at what happened in, in 1 Samuel 23, 15 through 18. David saw that Saul had come out to seek his life. And David was in the wilderness of Zip at Horesh. And Jonathan, Saul's son, rose and went to David at Horesh and strengthened his hand in God. Isn't that a beautiful image? Jonathan strengthened David's hand in God. And he said to him, don't fear. For the hand of Saul, my father, shall not find you. You shall be king over Israel. I shall be next to you. Saul, my father, also knows this. And the two of them made a covenant before the Lord. And David remained at Horish, And Jonathan went home. I haven't been able to get that image out of my mind. Jonathan strengthened David's hand in God. Friends, that's what you do when you go to someone in need. You strengthen their hand in God. You become a light that shines in the darkness of their lives. You become a, a word of hope that shouts in the midst of the chaos. How we all need our hands to be strengthened in God by those with whom God places us in relationship. Proverbs 17, 17 says, A friend loves at all times, and a brother is born out of adversity. Which leads us to that verse we've already talked about today, Hebrews 10, 24. Let us consider how to stir up one another to love and to good works. That's how we do it. That's how we strengthen one another's hands in God. We stir up one another to love and to good works. We love unconditionally. We relate to each other, not through a title or through a role, but as our real, raw selves, stripped of any pretense or mask. We notice the handiwork of God in our, relationships, in our relationships and we give him the thanks and we give him the glory and we honor him by responding to his promptings in our relationships and in all that we do. We live our lives knowing that we are God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved by God through Jesus. And in everything we say and in everything we do, we let that truth about us be the light that shines in the darkness that surrounds us. And if we can do that, there's not a doubt in my mind that we will always be a people who stand strong in our relationships. Which leads me to one last verse. It's not going to be on the screen because it came to me as I was driving here this morning. It's John 13, 35. Jesus was talking to his disciples. He's, it's, it's close to his, his crucifixion. And he's talking to his disciples and he says, let me tell you something. This is how they will know, they being those outside. This is, oh, look at that. <laughs> wow. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. It says it all. May that be declared of us. Everywhere we go and in everything we do. See how they love one another, may they say about us. So that when people see us, they'll see Jesus. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Gracious God.